In this video, I'm going to present you a key paper that I've read one week ago, Path Dependence and Persistence in the Spatial Economy. This is a bit different than the usual content of this channel, as this is addressed mostly to researchers, colleagues, PhDs, and potentially master's students in economics, as it will not be uh, in simple terms, but rather really representing what we are doing uh, during reading groups. And actually, this presentation, the slides set that I've prepared, have been prepared for a reading group at the University of Lausanne. And we had a really interesting conversation about this paper. I think it's a very important paper that have been also quite discussed at the University of Zurich, where I'm, I'm working now. And I think it's, it's important to discuss and present this paper together. And I will be glad as well to discuss with you below your, your thoughts on this uh, paper. If you're not a researcher, it might be just interesting to look at how we discuss stuff at the, uh, in academia and what is a reading group. Again, this paper by key author in economics have been available to, through the NBER uh, working paper series uh, last week, if I'm not mistaken, and it's already cited something like 37 times on Google Scholar. So it's a, really a paper that is attracting a lot of attention and for very good reasons. It's contributing to many different strands of the literature and potentially shed some light on very key aspects that affects many paper and research questions that we are interested in. So let's look at this paper more in detail right now. the presentation of this fascinating paper, Persistence and Path Dependence in the Spatial Economy. So modern e economic activity is staggeringly concentrated, or at least this is the case they present using the United States of America. Usually in the literature, you kind of accept that when you do something on the US, it, it's kind of the world. So let's focus on the US for this paper. And they start with this number that 16.6 percent of the value added in the us comes from onitricities which represent a very small amount of the total land area of the us and among those cities there are some completely or arguably random events that made those cities grow and be key cities in the economic activity in uh, in, in recent history so for example detroit called the, the Motor City was potentially became Detroit, the Motor City, just because Henry Ford was born nearby. And uh, another example is Buffalo, the City of Light, which was host of the Pan American Exposition uh, at uh, the time, so in 1901, where they illuminated the, the buildings with light bulbs, which really foster uh, progress and development within this area. And so the, the very important question they want to explore with this paper that affects really widely the literature are the following. How much of the spatial distribution of economic activity today is determined by history rather than by geographic fundamentals? And this made echo, at least I thought, directly to the famous paper and really fascinating paper that I've already presented at this channel, so link will be showed here now, uh, by Anderson and, and Whale, published in, uh, in the QG, where they show that geographic factors explain or predict more or approximately half of the difference in development today. And here they, they go and, and kind of not challenge this idea, but say, what, what about history? Is it just initial uh, shocks that might completely change the history, as we have seen with the two examples, Detroit and Buffalo City. And if yes, if history matters really for the distribution of the, in the spatial economy, does it also affect welfare, overall efficiency? And so basically what they do, they start with the theoretical framework, which is an overlapping generation model with two generations. You have children and adults who work. 
uh, and um, you have some geographic fundamentals and, and friction so friction for migration uh, based on the distance and friction on uh, for trade uh, using uh, iceberg costs and they, they they will use the theoretical framework to potentially show if and finds unfolds the condition for persistence and path dependence and then they will test this with empirical data for the us from 1800s to 2000 and then go way further than 2000 using uh, simulations where they basically will estimate labor supply and labor demands and due to the simultaneity of the two equations they will use an instrumental variable to unfold the causal effect and what do they find well basically they find the condition within the uh, theoretical framework uh, that goes in the direction for persistence or, or will predict persistence and path dependence and then with the empirical analysis they show that the value of the parameters they find fits uh, the prediction of the model for persistence and path dependence. So again, persistence is kind of due to the fact that the convergence rate might be low and hence it takes centuries to, to the, the shock will, will, um, will last for a long time. And path dependence will show that there are, we have multiple steady states uh, and basically one random shock might tip one place or another to a different steady state with a higher or lower uh, welfare and theoretically well the their theoretical model allows to show and characterize different conditions mostly that there is a unique path to equilibrium which is very important in that context that temporary shocks might be particularly persistent due to this slow rate of convergence that's they found the condition for multiple steady states and hence the possibility of path dependence and they found also bounds for aggregate welfare which will be very important in the very last part of the paper because it allows to assess if different history allows for going closer to the highest aggregate welfare and if different steady states or different yes different steady states will lead to to big difference or, or being all close to the highest level of welfare or if there is a big difference and long story short we will see that there is a significant difference and hence it, it's it's an important story and finding and all those results lies or or are in, uh, results from a tension between uh, agglomeration forces and dispersion forces and then empirically well they find uh, that's actually the the value of the parameters they find that suits uh, the, the prediction of the theoretical model for uh, persistence and path dependence they find modest productivity spillovers while they find important historical spillovers on amenities and then with simulation uh, the, the last three points here they found really strong persistence of shocks for example a 10 percent drop in population in the 1900s will leave the location nine percent smaller 100 years later so here an elasticity of actually 0.89 and aggregate welfare is also affected by some very small and slight changes and contra counterfactual in the initial conditions and they also found that those differences in welfare might be quite important for example for 500 years a difference in growth rate of 0.25 between the region which is leads to really massive differences in welfare aggregate with welfare and this paper concerns really many different strands of the literature to keep it simple i just pick and, and a bit sh short or not too long let's say i pick different key uh, elements uh, throughout the papers uh, and for example on these slides as well so first clearly there is this empirical part and this leads to all the papers uh, trying to assess causally the effect of spatial persistence and path dependence using different shocks of technology, shipping technology, or World War II bombing in, the, in Japan. It also helped a lot. So this paper, and for me, one of the key aspects that I, I might use uh, when I, I would cite this paper potentially in future work, it really unfolds and, and show a proper way to understand 
persistence of shock. So we have plenty of papers, uh, slave trades uh, in Africa during imperial time, uh, how it affects today uh, uh, development, so, so the non and Poga paper. And, and here you sometimes it's questioned, but can we really see effects that last that long or is it just some other as aspect that that creates the fact that there is this persistence of the shock uh, uh, after a hundred years or, or more and actually uh, this paper allows to to show really empirically and theoretically exactly the mechanism and, and prove that indeed we can rely on those persistent effects and 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 kind of trust them and, and see them in reality and I think that's the biggest contribution, at least in, in my view and in the way I will use it in the future. Of course, they use and, and contribute a lot to the theoretical literature. Basically, what they do is, is that they will take the state of the art model, simplify a bit by relying on the key results we found in the literature. And the fact that they slightly simplify those state of the art model will lead to, to models that are more tractable. And hence, you can extensively play and do simulations, find uh, empirical results, and um, and it contributes significantly to the literature and all those trends of the literature. So let's the fun begin. So for the theoretical model, you have uh, i location, so from, from one to n, and you have t periods. Uh, you have the index t for the periods from zero to whatever they want to, to look at in the future. And you have an overlapping generational model with two, uh, two periods. So you have children who live at the same place of their parents and have no choice, consume a part of the consumption of the a share of the consumption of the parents. And then you have adulthood where, where the children can work and pick the place where they want to live and have children. So there is constant population over time, no population growth here. I guess it's it's mostly because the the driver is is the the relative size of the population between places rather than, than relying on population growth. And hence the total population is constant over time, L upper bar. So LIT, a key variable that we will look at, is the number of workers, adults in a location I in time T. And then start with the production. You have the productivity level, which is uh, AIT, uh, and which rely on, on three uh, variables, on, on the past uh, labor force, which might have positive effect, or they argue and, and, and rely on many estimates in the literature that this strength of the past uh, spillover uh, from path uh, um, uh, workers is, is positive uh, due to local knowledge and durable in, in investment in local productivity and so on and so forth. And for LIT, for contemporaneous uh, workforce and effect of productivity, this is not uh, bounded or no prior on this, it might lead to congestions and then negative effects or uh, also positive spe uh, spillovers. And then very important and key in the paper for identification, there is a part that is completely exogenous, some shocks of uh, productivity. For consumptions, as I said, children consume a part of a uh, share of what the adults consume, and uh, they consume tradable goods and local housing based on land owned by real estate developer. So here are many parts also in the theoretical model that I shortened, first because it's not my field, it's a bit outside from my comfort zone. The idea was to keep also the, the, the video a bit, uh, not too long again. So I passed some parts, but hopefully I give the key ingredients to understand the identification and the main uh, conclusion of the paper. This leads to, to basically the welfare. The welfare is a, a capital WIT, which is basically based on the nominal wage divided by a price index, so the real wage and some amenity shifter, basically how pleasant it is to live uh, in a place, in location I uh, during time T, year T. And this uh, amenity shifter, UIT, is composed by three terms, also by historical uh, population and 
contemporaneous population. Again, both are not no prior on beta 1, beta 2. They might be positive or negative, local congestions against uh, investment in infrastructure and uh, caused by, by the size of the population. And again, key for the identification, there will be an exogenous amnity shifters U bar RT. Trades, uh, it's a bilateral model of trade. They use this gravity form of the bilateral trades. And here the key, uh, if I can keep things simple, is just they use an iceberg trade, iceberg trade cost. So basically it just simple, but just to recall it, it's like you have a, when you send an iceberg through the ocean, it melts with the distance and hence it's, it's the same here. Either you compute a, an additional cost for sending the, the goods uh, proportionally to the distance, but here it's rather, it's, it's the idea is that the, the shipment will, will shrink, but it's similar uh, effect. It's more costly to send further. And you have friction for migration, so you can travel, but, but you have some friction. The further, the more, uh, costly it is and basically to choose the location so when children pass to adulthood basically they they want to maximize their welfare and they want hence to pick j so the location where they are going in such a way that they maximize welfare and welfare it's the equation that we have seen before but here we have also the some idiosyncratic taste for different places basically uh, this vector of epsilon Basically, everyone prefer more or less different places because they like the food, they like the landscape or things like that, that might be random or accepted to be random. And so welfare, well, you have the adulthood pay you have whilst you are a child. It's, it's the, you, the expectation of the maximum uh, welfare how you maximize the welfare and the childhood payoff and then together what they call ex ante welfare will be a cup douglas form so you have the, the square root of the project of the the two period welfare and hence they are able to define and uh, the dynamic equilibrium which is a sequence of finite prices and strictly positive allocations such such that goods and markets clear in all periods and basically they show that for any strictly positive vector li0 so the initial distribution of the population in uh, in the, the model and the uh, uh, geography vector of of amnities uh, uh, shocks or random effects and productivity uh, productivity a bar uh, also uh, random shocks combined with the migration friction and trade friction leads to an equilibrium in the vector of all the endogenous variable, welfare, wage, uh, population, and so on. So what do they find with this model? Well, they find that there is a unique path to equilibrium, that temporary shocks are particularly persistent due to alpha one, that multiple uh, steady states exist, mostly due to alpha two, and which leads to the possibility of path dependence. So basically an economy being tipped in a different steady state just due to one historical shock. And uh, they found also boundaries for, for maximum and minimal aggregate welfare, which will be very useful in the very last part of the paper to assess if the different alternative counterfactual histories are very far from each other, from the, the top boundary of, of aggregate welfare, or if they, they are close together. And again, all the model relies on the, the tension between strength of agglomeration and dispersion forces. So basically the spillovers against uh, positive spillovers or negative spillovers against also the, the trade and migration frictions. Now let's turn to the empirical model and start with the data. They focus on the US from 1800s to 2000s. And we have a total of, of regions of uh, approximately thousands. Due to the model being an overlapping generational model to, to assess those different periods, they take 50 years intervals. And uh, the goal again is to estimate all those parameters of strength, elasticities, 
and geographic fundamentals, so, so frictions and, and those uh, shocks on annuity and productivity. And this will allow to measure the, the strength of persistence or possibility that uh, the, there is persistence and path dependence empirically. And so the data they use are county level decennial census data by age group. So they have basically by age group the, the size of the population of working age, age, and they have the total income. So by dividing this by the, the number of uh, individuals working age, they get also the, the nominal wage. Uh, they get the, my, the flow of migration based on the birth states uh, of the respondents. And for trades flows, they use the community flow survey. So for their estimation, they use three steps. First, they have to assess the trade and migration cost, mu and tau. Then they use those predicted values to predict migration and, and trade flows. And once they have this, they can solve the model and predict inward and outward market access. Once they have all those values, they are able to solve and find and predict um, labor supply or inverse labor supply and inverse labor demand. So the first step is to find tau and mu, if you want, the, the, the friction for migration and, and uh, trade. So, to do that, they use really a simple method, uh, gravity equation. So basically, uh, trade will depend on, on the, uh, in the log here. So you have the exponents uh, multiplying here. You have, uh, sorry, uh, the trade and migrations are a function of the, the log of the distance. And they, by using those regressions or regressing uh, those variable on distance uh, they, and putting fixed effects, they get uh, estimate for kappa and lambda and hence for those frictions. And then second step, once they have those parameters, they can predict and find estimate for MMT for the, so for the migration flow and for the, the, the trade flow. And then it allows to solve the model and find for inward and out or outward trade market access. And once they have this, they can estimate the inverse labor demand and uh, inverse labor supply. So again, definitely, I'm not a theorist. This is out from, of my comfort zone. So maybe not so much, so many details here, more a bit uh, on what's next. But again, the idea is really to give you the broad idea of what's happening. Uh, and if you want to more, feel free to discuss below or uh, to read the paper. So basically, we have inverse labor demand, which depends on historical shifter, uh, so population, outward trade market access, and exogenous unobserved component of productivity. While on the inverse labor demand, also historical shifter, and also supply of migrants, and most importantly, exogenous unobserved component of amnity. So basically, you have in both labor supply and labor demand those exogenous parts. And this is very useful because actually the two labor supply and labor demand to have the, 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 the equilibrium, basically, you have this simultaneity bias. So your OLS estimate will be biased. And hence, they use an IV strategy, really neat IV strategy to uh, solve for this issue and, and unfold the, the, the unbiased estimates. And they will rely on those shifters that I mentioned for amnity and for productivity. And they are plausible instruments only if they are orthogonal, which they argue is the case. Always conditional to the fact that they control for location and region year fixed effect. So what's the IV for the amnities? Basically, they use a quite simple strategy, but efficient strategy, which is amenity represent how pleasant it is to or attractive it is because it's pleasant to live in a place. And basically, it's unpleasant due to high temperature or too low temperature. So to make those shocks, random shocks uh, are not weather shocks, but rather they use the technological advance in air conditioning, AC, 
and more effective heating systems. And so they there. So meaning that the extreme hot cold is more bearable. So their instruments is really straightforward. They use a linear time trends which they interact with the average minimum temperature in the warmest month and the average minimum temperature in the coldest month. And they also control for square terms, allowing for non-linearities. So this is quite simple, with the assumption that each period there is a similar and equal development of air conditioning or, or heating system, which make better amenity based on, on how extreme the weather is in a place this is uh this will foster or increase amenities and hence uh attract more people and also they are they are allow actually it's, I, I said that the the jump are constant over time the improvement in technology this is not right uh, correct because they use also the squared value so it might be uh, with decreasing return for example which might be uh, something more realistic and they use worldclim.org uh, data for those weather extreme. Then for the supply of labor, they use shocks in productivity of agriculture. And here they use two uh, instruments, a within crop and a between crop productivity shock. The first instrument is represent the gain in the higher intensity cultivation based on crop suitability. Basically, in the, base, in the starting of the sample, 1800s, you have very low productivity or simple methods for agriculture, while you, you end up with really high intensity agriculture and, and, and higher productivity. So what they do is that they, they use the yield of corn, so the, the most widely grown uh, uh, crop in the US, and they look at the differential, so the gain in yields for each region between low intensity agriculture and high intensity agriculture. So, so, so basically some region will really gain from technological improvement or increase for, for agriculture, while others will have moderate gains and they exploit those differences. And the second, so this is a within crop instrument. They, they use also between crop instrument. Basically, they show that the demand for wheat is quite constant uh, within the sample period. But soy, for example, is more and more grown in the US to be sent mostly in Asia. And hence, through time, there is more and more importance uh, of soy uh, crop. So what they do is, again, they use simply the differential yield between soy and wheat interacted with a linear time trend. So each period you will need more and more, you will send more and more crops. So it's more beneficial. You have this external gain of productivity if you can grow soy between those regions. They also control for differential uh, yield, so the mean of those differential variables and the standard deviation. And all those variables comes from, as you might have expected, the FAO guys, which is a really fantastic source of data and, and, and widely used uh, for good reasons. So now if we look at the results, remember, the first step of the strategy was to have assess mu and tau, which are the friction for respectively migration and tau for trade and basically here they found with their strategy so distance using a gravity uh, equation um, they found estimate that are close to what you would expect and found find in the literature then they solve the model as i shown with step two and step three the most important step in my opinion is the following basically they here they did i miss something no uh, for labor demands they estimate and here they just explain what what are the parameters not the variable to predict those but what are the parameter of interest that they try to predict here that's really the point against for this uh part the, re the result of the empirical part so recall they have the theoretical model which shows or describe conditions for persistence and path dependence and now they want to estimate those the value of those parameters to see if they fit the range of the parameters 
within the theoretical model that will predict path dependence and persistence. So they do those predictions, and when they have all of those uh, together for labor demand, alpha 1, alpha 2, and sigma, the issue is that they argue there, there is multicorelinearity. So the, the estimates are, are impre imprecisely estimated, and hence, uh they they cannot really rely on this regression so what they will do is that actually they will use a standard measure for for sigma uh five or nine uh, lower estimate and higher estimate in the literature and then they split the problem and just try to estimate the two other parameters and then they found that there is very weak evidence for historical predictivity spillover or weak uh, strength of this effect while they define contemporaneous productivity spillov spillovers. So those are the elasticities. Then they turn to the supply, of course, and they, they, they face the same issue. If you, they try to estimate all the parameters at the same time, it's too demanding for the, 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 uh, for the model, and hence they, they, they are imprecisely, uh, imprecisely estimated. The, the values are out. Uh, the potential 95% in confidence interval gives values out of the usual boundaries or relevant boundaries for those parameters. So then they split again the problem. They, they accept or try with some key and ac widely accepted value of the parameters and they uh, estimate the two main spillover uh, parameters that they are interested in so first it was alpha one and alpha two now it's beta one beta two for the amnesty spillovers and here they found large and statistically significant estimate for the historical amnesty spillovers forgot to say that the f-stat for the first stage is really high. It's 3,000, 7,000, and before it was 28, 75. Anyway, way higher than the, the, the threshold of 10. So with those estimation, they are indeed able to say that those values fit and imply a unique dynamic path, but imply also multiplicity of steady states and uh, pers so persistence and path dependence. So they are able to first show theoretically the conditions. Now they show that they found those conditions for path dependence and or, or, or rather that the value of the parameters fits the condition for path dependence and persistence uh, within this empirical setup. So then they go and, and do what they call a Eric exercise. They do simulations up to year 3,500 to look at. Now that we know that it's there, what's important is the quantification. Again, it's not always you necessary or, or what we are really interested. It's the first step to see if it's statistically significant and you find that, okay. now. What about the magnitude? So they want to quantify that and use simulation to have enough time period uh, to do so. So they do three types of, of simulation, one which will allow to do a decomposition, how important, what's the share of the variation that can be attributed or predicted by history. Then they do some counterfactuals. And at, finally, they will also look at the how far they are from aggregate welfare with those different counterfactuals. So first part, very simple part and straightforward. They use a linear decomposition of the of the of their equation, and basically they can show that the, the log of the population in in the final year t capital T depends on three three parts, history, path of fundamentals, and path of markets. Note that path of markets depend as well from history. So, so when they will look at the, what's the proportion of the variance explained by this part over the total, it's a lower boundary for how important is history. And why they do so, so variance decomposition, they show that actually history plays a, a large role. And it's if they take the initial period to be uh, 1800, it represents 32 percent of the total variation is predicted by history only uh, and on um, yeah on amnesty uh, yeah uh, no so initial sorry initial uh, period so really initial conditions 
well, if they start in 1850, it's, uh, it's larger, 56.6% of the variation explained by, by this. And finally, in 1900s, 63.9%, uh, so even more important. So then they ask the question, how different will be the spatial economy look today if historical conditions have been different? So basically, again, back to those key examples where some random events made some part of the world and, and uh, some part of the US more developed than, than others. They want to see if they switch those initial conditions between places, how different uh, those places uh, end up. And what they do is that first they rank by population, initial population, all the places, and they swap randomly between the two each pairs, they pair places uh, by the size of their population if they are uh, closest. And then when they, they paired uh, those places, I, I said they, they use a Bernoulli distribution to, to just swap randomly with a 50-50% chance um, between their real uh, initial value and the uh, counterfactual uh, initial condition of uh, amnities. Yes. And they run a hundred simulation from 1900 to 3,000, so 3,500, so 30 generations. And what do they find? Well, basically, again, to make things simple, they find that the, the median elasticity is 89. So, so this means that's in, in 2000. So this means that a 10% reduction, sh negative shock on the population in 1900, a hundred year before, implies a reduction of the population of 9% still a hundred years later. So really persistent shock and important shocks. And even 500 after the, the elasticity remains really high, 45%. So this 10% negative shock in 1900s remains an impact 500 years later by, by a factor of 45% of this initial shock. And then they, now that they answered the question about persistence, they turn to path dependence. And they look at how different those counterfactuals might affect aggregated welfare. And what they, they show is that indeed aggregated welfare rise, total aggregate, uh, aggregated welfare rise as children can cho choose the endogenously the, the location where they go and then uh, go to more attractive locations, which makes the economy more efficient as a whole. They show that this process stabilizes uh, around 300 to 400 years. And then there is also very small growth rates that makes some situation when they end up the steady state like much later, but, but being very close to the steady state. And so leading to path dependence, basically different steady states, low convergence for, for persistence again. And what they show and what is more important and the big point here is that due to the theoretical model, they have an estimate for the highest value for the aggregated welfare. And here they show that there is substantial differences between the steady states of uh, with respect to the aggregated welfare so basically with those very simple and small counterfactual they can tip the economy in different situations where locally the place is affected but also the economy as a whole reach different steady states more or less close to the optimal welfare distribution or, or optimal not distribution but aggregated welfare and so this fascinating paper uh, allowed to give foundation, theoretically, empirical proof of persistence and path dependence in the spatial economy, which is very useful for many strands of the literature. So really a fascinating paper. And I thought, because there, there was something quite striking and in the conclusion, I, I wanted to, to share a very good advice uh, that a, a senior researcher in the University of Lausanne told me a few years ago. And I think reading groups are made for exchanging also the, those, those things and, and this knowledge. So basically, the, in the last paragraph of the conclusion, if you look at the paper, they cite quite many different 
strand of the literature where this will contribute. It's not the literature review, it's rather, well, this will help in that direction, in that direction, in that direction. And this is a very useful trick to increase the chance of being published because from the perspective of the journal, they think you, 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 you might be discovering something really important, but it might even close the door and stop research in that direction. It's not often the case, but it might be the case. While here, by citing many other and opening the discussion, how you will contribute, but again, it's slightly different from the literature review, it's really now those different strands of the literature will, will grow. This is or might be viewed by the journal as a very important uh, positive side because it means that you will be cited a lot because then it's not closing a door but opening many. And hence, in this world of publication and citation, it's a very important strategy to, to, to do your advertisement for your paper, basically. So what do you think? What do you think are the big contributions? Do you have questions on this paper? Definitely far from my comfort zone. So I hope it was clear and, and contributed and helped you or saved you hours of, of reading. And do you think this paper will end up in the top five in other category of journals and will you cite it and if yes in which context and for, for which part uh, contribution of the paper so so thank you very much for being here with me on this presentation and following it on this channel uh, looking forward to discussing research either in the comment below on linkedin on or in the future on this platform and i wish you the best and a very nice day